Well, good morning, everyone. I would be much, much more comfortable if I knew all of you by name so well that I could just glance at you and know exactly your name. But unfortunately, it's a little bit too early in my time here at Peace, and I'm a little too old in life to have that kind of recall. So uh, I will do my best in that regard. I want to, uh, I am John Wassum, Pastor John Wassum. I've been a pastor for right at 40 years, well, a little over 40 years now. And uh, I have had the opportunity both personally to be involved in succession or transitional processes, and I've also been involved in assisting many, many more in various capacities. And I want to say, uh, genuinely, that the process that you all have engaged in, to the extent to which I am aware of it, which I don't think I'm at 100% quite yet, maybe no one including Walter is, I'm not sure, but I'm impressed. I'm impressed by the thoroughness of it, the thoughtfulness of it. And I told Walter uh, recently that this little gathering we have today, I don't want you to view this as some incidental uh, event where the church is required to jump through a hoop or something, because this is brilliant. The opportunity to hear from a cross-section of the congregation, and I have no idea how long each of you have been a part of this uh, a community of faith. Some of you may have been here from nearly the beginning. Others of you, it would be more, much more recently. And that adds to the good dynamic of it, to have the di diversity. But the opportunity to hear very unscripted, no rehearsals, you're just speaking from your heart, and uh, for that to be shared is uh, immensely valuable. Of course it's valuable because this information will become part of the archive of this congregation. But in my view, as valuable as that is, it's secondary. The primary is that maybe more than all of us could realize in this moment, what you'll share over the next hour and 45 minutes or so will will really guide to some degree maybe to a significant degree this transition process for the entire congregation in your stories behind them there are principles that are so important to the life of any organization but certainly to the life of a community of faith so I don't want you to be nervous about what you say. Uh, I want you to just speak as though you and I were uh, sitting at a cafe having a cup of coffee and I asked you a question and you began sharing it. Uh, I will ask for the sake of video that uh, when I ask a question that prompts a response that uh, if I'm able, if time permits. Now, also understand, don't, don't shoot the messenger here. Uh, I, I'm not going to have control over that almighty clock. And so there are going to be times when I'm going to need to keep us moving a little bit. And that means that there might be three people that would love to respond to a particular question. I, and I, ha I may have to, you know, keep it to one of you. Or I may even... And please don't be offended. Uh, if, if, I, if I in some way, shape, or form indicate to you to speed it up a little bit, uh, that's not because you're boring me silly. It's because of that clock that is ticking. And I want to honor your time as well as keep this to a reasonable overall length for its purpose. So I'll do my best to respectfully and carefully uh, manage the flow of things. But if I, I do uh, come to you, like Patty, if you're going to answer, I'll come to you and, and you'll take the microphone and then you'll say, 
I'm Patty McLeod. McLeod. I'm Patty McLeod, and I've been part of Peace for about 10 years, 15 years. I just came in off the street today, you know, <laughs> what, what, whatever it might be, because that will give perspective. Please understand that at some point, maybe multiple times, there will be an individual who is a prospective candidate, and he or she will have the opportunity to watch what we, we do today. And uh, I told uh, Pastor Walter, if I were candidating for this church, and you presented me from your council with this beautiful dossier that explained everything about the church, and it was just magnificent and compelling, I'd be impressed. But that wouldn't make my decision. It's this kind of connection that would really touch my heart. And as a future shepherd, lead me uh, to make a decision whether to come or not, and if I come, to have greater insight. So this is pretty valuable. Now I'm going to get my clicking, uh, my clicking talk, my ticking clock started. I can figure it out. Our being here together as a community of faith, as followers of Jesus Christ today, is to capture the story of Peace Lutheran Church. We're only going to capture a minute portion of the story. But our hope and prayer is that the story that we do capture because of your contribution will be a good representation of the heart and soul of this church. And it really reminds us of that magnificent story in the Gospels, Luke chapter 24, that's often referred to as the road to Emmaus. Now, that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, said, Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem, and do you not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. And we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all of this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. When they went to the tomb early this morning, they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. Now, We're on a walk today. And what we share in this conversation will seem as though it's principally reflecting on the past. But someone has said, 
fairly brilliantly, not me, that history is prologue. And so as you share stories from the questions that I'll ask of you, we're going to begin together by listening to each other and by the larger congregation of faith listening to this video to begin to tease out from your stories those key aspects of the heart and soul of Peace Lutheran Church. And that will not just simply be a nostalgic walk back through time. It will speak to today's transition and tomorrow's glorious opportunity to give glory to God. So this is very valuable. It's important, but I don't want you to be nervous as you share it, all right? We're talking as friends, walking along the road. And we will have our hearts burning within us just as happened on that road to Emmaus because we're hearing those values. We're hearing those principles that were so important. So let me begin, and I have no earthly idea if any one of you is in a position to even answer this question. But would there be one or more of you who could share from your earliest remembrance of a time when Peace Lutheran Church was being founded and what that motivation was behind the founding of this church in the very beginning. Can anyone share a story that relates to that? Well, as you were talking, I was listening and thinking at the same time, and my husband Art and I, we would leave the church we were attending at the time, years ago, and we would make a beeline down our well-traveled path, Summerlin Road to Pine Ridge Road to San Carlos Road to the beach every Sunday morning after church. And we would pass a sign along the way that said, Peace Lutheran Church. And it said ELCA, and that is what we came from in Minnesota. So we assumed that their philosophy or their belief system was in line, or more in line with than what we had been attending. So we dropped in, and lo and behold, how many years ago was that? Well, it was before 2000, and we stayed all that time. So that was the beginning for us, and that was our reason. Hmm. Thank you. John? Yes. I uh, don't think there's anyone here that was a part of the uh, first worship service that probably happened uh, in 1994. Uh, when a group of people were brought together by Pastor Dick Hafer, who was the uh, Dean of the Calusa Conference, and knew about a group that had decided that they no longer uh, had what it would take to develop a mission on Senebel Island, as well as another group that uh, had left a church because of some issues there. Uh, Dick brought those two groups together and uh, it was a small group of about 28 people. We still have some of them that are still a part of our parish, but some of them are homebound now. Uh, but those 28 people that came together recognized that they had both come from a, a lot of turmoil. The Senebel experiment of trying to plant a church there, as well as what had happened at another congregation. And when they came together, uh, someone suggested, wow, there feels to be such a spirit of peace here. Hmm. And that's why the name peace was begun and why it was put on this church. It was a shepherd of the Isles on Senebel, and uh, that was the name that they had. But they decided to start a new beginning. And the people that I have talked to in my ministry here who have shared stories of that always, feel, always shared a sense that they felt God was leading them together to plant this new church here in southwest Florida. 
The national churches had looked at this area back in the 80s for development. There really wasn't much in this area of Iona McGregor. And uh, so that's why they didn't really invest in it, in planning a new mission here. It was only when these two groups came together that the national church said, let's try it as a synodically authorized worship site and then eventually to appoint a pastor developer. Hmm. So all those things were happening in the early, or I'm sorry, in the mid-1990s when it, the church was beginning to be formed. Very good. I love hearing that word about how the name peace even came to be. I'm not surprised to hear that was it, but could any of you speak to what this area regionally was like in terms of residential development, commercial development, schools, the type of roads, etc.? I've heard a few things from some of the folk where I live who have told me stories going back into those early days. Could one of you describe physically the context in which uh, Peace Lutheran Church came to meet temporarily in rented facilities and then eventually to this building. Could any of you speak to that? And be sure to give your name and how long you've been with Peace as you begin. Hi, my name is Art Johnson and my wife Debbie and I moved here to Florida in about 1996 as a as a winter retreat. At that time, there were a lot of there was a lot of open land. Um, travel was was light, and it was easy to get around. You could get from one place to another without having to wait in lines and so on. Um, I remember going to to a ball game at the Twin Stadium, Hammond Stadium, looking out across the outfield and seeing cows in the pasture. And it was not uncommon to see an agricultural uh, area that was present here. Um, as time grew on, of course, the lots began to fill up, the tiers, the trees were taken down, and a housing development was placed. As the housing development took place, there were more cars, more traffic jams, and gated communities, and it became very, very difficult to, to move around. I anticipate that trend is going to continue, and it will be more and more difficult, and so on. And that also creates uh, problems for the, the structure um, inside the schools, the churches, the, the building, the stores, and so on. And um, it's, it's something we're going to have to, to deal with in the future. Yeah. Thank you, Art. And with this increased density that's coming, there are lots of positives. Uh, there are negatives, of course. But what that means is there's going to be more and more people exponentially coming here who, who need God, who need the connection of God's people, who need the peace that passes understanding, which is what this congregation by its very namesake is committed to doing. Um, were any of you part of peace when it met in its temporary facilities that were rented prior to this m magnificent structure being built and occupied and utilized. Any of you in that category? Jim? Name and little. Um, Jim Kruger, um, yes, my wife and I moved here and um, arrived on Christmas Day 2003, as a matter of fact. And uh, we're looking for a, an ELCA church to, to join. And uh, we, we noticed by looking in the phone book there weren't a real lot of choices. As a matter of fact, I'm not sure if we even saw a piece in the phone book at that time. Uh, and so we did visit some others. Uh, but we lived very close to the Masonic Temple where we, they were meeting uh, temporarily and uh, drove past and saw the signs and uh, whatever and said ELCA and and so we we visited their service along with half a dozen other churches in the area and and um, I guess just uh, fell in love with the welcoming uh, nature of it, uh, you know, the, 
the second Sunday that we returned, uh, there was a name tag hanging on the uh, name tag board with our names on it, and we thought, wow, uh, this is uh, really a, a shocking development, and uh, you know, we've been here ever since. Jim, what was it like, from your perspective, for you to attend church in a rented facility. Many times new churches meet in schools or they meet in community centers or other types of buildings like the Masonic Lodge. What was it like going from an established, more traditional type of church and worship setting to meeting to the worship of uh, our Lord Jesus Christ in uh, a temporary facility like that? Speak to that, please. Well, I don't think it, it struck me as being unusual. Uh, the um, people that were in charge of the services each uh, Sunday morning would bring in the, the altar, the temporary setting, set up the chairs and things of this nature at the end of the service. They had to put them all away because it wasn't a church and it wasn't our building. Uh, but uh, when the people came, it, it certainly seemed um, church-like. So I guess it, it didn't strike me as a, as a strange setting any more so than visiting maybe a different, maybe country church or something like that that's in a different setting than this is. So that didn't strike me as unusual. All right. Please. Just to tell you a little bit of detail, um, as you know, uh, just so for the sake of our history, that uh, Pastor George Frank served as the uh, pastor to help uh, from he was from Christ Lutheran Church in Cape Coral who supplied retired pastors to uh, the mission uh, and uh, they developed a, a wonderful sense of uh, making things happen uh, Hank Scheig who had been a part of uh, CEO of AAL uh, built a portable altar out of a door that uh, folded very conveniently uh, they uh, made some vestments or and paraments out of uh, simple cloth that were beautiful um, and they had to set up and take down chairs so that became a, a very important part of our life for quite a few years uh, I think we were at the Masonic Temple I was there about 10 years as a pastor developer um, no, I'm sorry. I would not be. I would, uh, we were, the mission was there about ten years. I would. I came in '99, so we were there for about six years of my ministry. Um, the um, thing about the Masonic Temple was that there was no windows in it because of the Masonic rituals, and. Um, but they wanted to be, make it like a church, and so one of our, our, our first organists, Mary Kent, uh, went to a Goodwill and bought an organ for $100. And uh, she developed the choir and uh, played wonderful music, so that became an important part of our life. John Kent, her husband, became the lead of the steering committee and helped in many ways to organize uh, the event. Uh, one of our one of the fellows there, Everett Root, said, "Well, if you're going to build a church, you have to feed the people," and so he took on developing ways to have a coffee hour every week. It was really nice there because we had the worship center. Then we would move over right next door to the fellowship center where tables and chairs had been set up. And Everett, I'm not sure where he got it, if it was legal or not, but he got a shopping cart. And so all of our supplies for our kitchen, our coffee pot, our uh, sugar, our cups were kept in this little uh, shopping cart that was pushed back and forth every day. And one of the things that became a part of our life at the Masonic Temple was, that, especially down here in Florida, was that sometimes we would find roaches eating the sugar. And uh, that became a bit disconcerting. So we had a wonderful experience at the Masonic Temple. The, the people were very interested in finding a, and planting a place where people could worship, where we would develop small group ministry, and we couldn't hold them there. We went to the local restaurant to develop small groups, or into people's homes to develop small groups. So it was a place where we really, it was an incubator 
where we could really grow, but there was always an urgency to try to get out and to figure out how we were going to buy the land, where we are going to build the church. Those questions were always there, but we took it slowly and deliberately, knowing that God was leading us forward in this journey. Thank you, Lord. Raise your hand if you were part of the church prior to this building being occupied on McGregor. All right, so I have a question for you. Would you mind? That's fine. Give us your name, and, and then I'll share the question. My name is Lois Helvick. How do you do, Lois? So my question is, describe for us, from your vantage point, what congregational life was like meeting without a permanent facility, as Pastor Walter said, needing to use homes, restaurants, etc., for group gatherings, etc. What was congregational life like in that temporary period? Uh, I can only speak as a visitor as we would come down and visit with Pastor Jorgen Vogie, who was a member here, a pastor uh, in several places, and also um, a president of Lutheran Social Services before he came here, and he was in Fargo, North Dakota. So we would visit uh, Pastor Vogie, and he said to us one Sunday before we came, um, well, we've got a new place to meet but I don't know if you really are interested, but it's in the Masonic Temple. I said, well, that sounds good. And with that, we went with him, and um, for a few years after that, every time we came down to visit, because we lived in Minneapolis, and that's where our employment was, um, we would go to church with Pastor Vogie. Always very, very welcoming. I've seen no difference. Now I am an associate member because um, uh, we still have part residence in Minnesota. Um, this church is a very welcoming church from the large parking lot that's been <laughs> built, um, which invites people mm -hmm. because there's always a place to park, to the inside, to the pastor, to all of the people that are involved and um, I can't speak highly enough of Peace Lutheran Church. Mm, thank you. Well, you touch on it, and that is, regardless of how large or small, fancy or simple, the building itself may be, the real heart and soul of a church are the people and the culture that develops as that uh, network among all those people. I would, I, I, I might be opening Pandora's box with this question, but I would love to hear what, at least from your point of view, is a really funny story about something that happened in the life of this congregation. Now, remember, you're being taped. <laughs> but... Uh, would someone have a story, humorous, funny, that just kind of illustrates, uh, again, that heart and soul of this church? I would be interested to know. I've seen two elbows go like this, so I think there are a few stories. Name. I'm Marilyn Cranick. Um, I was not here at the time, but I hear a story of using the facility prior to the occupancy permit coming through, and I think Pastor Walter would need to tell that story. Ah, and how, uh, how long was he in jail? <laughs> <laughs> so we have an illegality yes. to discuss and just get it out in the open. So uh, when we were moving into this facility, we had hoped to be in here in, on Palm Sunday of 2005. We had even uh, or, uh, had the bishop coming to uh, offer a blessing to the church, we had maybe a dedication. But we saw that building was going to take much longer than we expected. And, um, but people, we had, it was a height of season. We were packed over at the Masonic Temple. We had gone to two worship services over there. 
and there was a great deal of eagerness because we had had a few temp worship services over here on the land uh, in its early days we really wanted to try to get in this place and so uh, we did something illegal we came in the place and uh, had a worship service and afterwards the fire marshal did say they were aware that we were here but they did not stop us but it was magnificent uh, we had to rent 400 chairs we had to rent a sound system Mary Kent had a little organ I think my daughter played French horn with her friend for one of the services and we had both Palm Sunday and Easter and it was not publicized because we didn't want the fire marshal to come and stop us but th by the word of mouth this place was packed there were no windows the, uh, the, for the coffee afterwards we had the coffee pot and donuts on the stack of plywood out in the narthex <laughs> we had porta johns uh, for people we had people out there directing traffic and it was just a magnificent magnificent gathering we did that also on Easter Sunday and uh, that then there's a little bit more few a few more things in here but it was really a wonderful way for us to come and enjoy this place and it really was a magnificent highlight of many people's lives and for many of the people who had worked so hard to gather the funds for this facility you know it sacrificed it was really a way to say that God was making it happen it was always a question would God make this place happen would God send more people and for those leaders who were the pioneers years to be able to see my gracious me we had 425 people the place was backed and they're coming back next week it created a wonderful sense of spirit I hope you have some VHS tapes that have this on video and uh, I happen to have a VHS player so if you need to borrow it just say the word <laughs> but uh, how about another funny story yeah I saw that elbow <laughs> Introduce yourself, George. Name is George Avery. Um, funny, well, I'll tell the story. One Sunday morning, I was an assistant minister with Pastor Walt, and I'm about to raise up the Eucharistic wafer and give the prayer, not realizing that part of my right arm and vestments had knocked it off the altar and onto the floor, and I just looked down there was nothing there and Pastor Walt was pointing on the floor kind of smiling which at the time I didn't think was very funny <laughs> well regardless we continued on all was well in conjunction with that another Sunday morning and I may have been the only person to do this again as an assistant minister our cup holding the wafers he had a small attachment for gluten-free wafers. My vestment hit that. Now I was standing in front of the congregation this time. Knocked them everywhere. Thank goodness, people from the altar guild picked everything up. We went on as if nothing happened. But what it does speak to, I think, is the uh, common sense and humility of Pastor Walt. He's like, well, we'll just We'll just keep going. All is well. And uh, took some of the uh, severe moments out of my uh, thought process that day. <laughs> so I'll give you an incentive to stick around after we're done and eat together and enjoy some fellowship because there's food going to be provided for us all for lunch. If you stick around, I'll tell my funny story from when we started a church. And, no offense, George, but I think my story is a little funnier. But we'll we'll find out. I mean, I know you have to be there, but all right. One more, just one more important story. <laughs> Our dear organist Mary Kent uh, uh, came to a point where she was going to retire, and so we had scheduled her final. Uh, celebration uh, on Reformation Sunday. I'm not sure what year it was, but Hurricane or Tropical Storm Wilma had gone through, and we as a church had lost power for about a week. But we still gathered. We had lights, uh, battery lights in the bathroom, and as many uh, other things we could do to make sure it was a safe place. And so we were going through the service, and Mary was playing everything on the piano. 
and uh, she really loved the new organ and would really wanted to play something. And during the Eucharist, um, we came to the point where we prayed the Lord's Prayer. And we as we were praying the Lord's Prayer, I started to hear things clicking around the building. And lo and behold, the lights came on. <laughs> And so it was just wonderful. We all clapped, we were all happy because then the air conditioning came on. It was really important for us. Well, as we always do whenever we have a major event around here with the staff where the leaders always say, well, what did we learn? What can we do better next time? And so at the council meeting, one of the council members, as we were talking about this, looked at me and says, Pastor Walter, I learned one thing. You need to pray the Lord's Prayer earlier than what we did. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe quote Genesis 1 right. and the Lord said let there be light yeah all right um, someone who has not uh, shared yet speak to how in those not only in the early days but even up to the present how do people that live in this area around where Peace Lutheran Church is located, where, it, where it's living and breathing and serving in Jesus' name. How do the people find out about Peace Lutheran Church, other than driving down McGregor and seeing a sign? How do they find out? Who would like to speak to that? Maybe share a story of how someone ended up coming uh, through that means. It's going to be short. It's fine. It's Rick, Rick Yagi. I'm going to uh, snitch on our missions people. And one of the ways people find out about us is the red kettle at Publix and how they take a turn, they take a whole day, and they fill in holes that people who walk by see Peace Lutheran Church is doing the bell ringing. And we, I mean, there was TV interviews last year and so forth. That's just an unusual way. Yeah. But one of the ways that's unique for us, I think. Why don't you speak about what you do with music? Well, too? because that's, that's, that's me talking about music. Yeah, so please do it. Well, okay. So another thing, when I was, when I was brought by the one to come and dance with, uh, we talked about having how we were going to do that, and we decided on a concert series. And the concert series is now like in its 11th year or 12th year, about five concerts a year. Um, We've had everything from um, oh, the, the, the drum, oil can drum people. We've had, um, it's just been an amazing variety. But two things that happen, we have a wonderful relationship with St. Column Kill, where Lee comes over and brings his people, and there's about 350 that show up. A bunch of visitors find out who we are and where we are. And we bring in national people too, and that's just been a real good way to introduce people, low impact, but they find out who we are, where we are, and what we do. So that's been one of the good things. Well, the church does not exist for itself. Now, there are churches that seem as though they exist for themselves. But the church was never intended to, it, to exist for itself. Uh, the church was not brought into this world for the purpose of telling the good news. But the church was brought into being to be the good news. And that's accomplished through things like Rick just shared. And I'm sure the involvement of this church at the Gladiolus Food Pantry, which I understand and I'm looking forward to learning much more about firsthand, but I understand is quite extensive and has been ongoing for some time. Now, I would love to hear one of you share a story. Uh, you, you can keep it anonymous as far as who you're speaking about. That's fine. Uh, but to share a story about someone who came to this church and whose life has just honestly never been the same since. It's made that much of a difference or a contribution to him or her. I would love to hear one of you share a story like that. Do you happen to have one that you could share? And introduce yourself. 
I'm Patty McLeod, and we came here five years ago. We had gone to five other churches in the area, and we were just not feeling a friendly home. So one day while we were at our community talking about bocce and churches and a few other things, um, one of the girls there said, you got to try the Lutheran church. You know, we had been going to Episcopalian churches, which George had been involved in up in New York. And so we said, really? And she goes, it's almost the exact same ministry. You'll really enjoy it. I think you'll find the friendly people you're looking for. So after five different churches, going several weeks, giving them a second and third chance, we came here on a Sunday, and Pastor Walcher greeted us at the door on our way out, to which George had said, I'd really like to know more about the church. So instead of just saying, well, there's a pamphlet over there or whatever, he said, if you could wait around just a moment, he goes, I'll be with you in a few minutes. He goes, I'd like to sit down and talk with you. He took us into his office, which to me was almost unheard of, um, that somebody was going to do that right away. And everyone else in the church was just so friendly. And again, we had our name badges the following week, because we did come back. And we've been coming back ever since. And to talk about life being changed, it has been an amazing journey because it has changed our lives. Marilyn has done so much for the community around us, our parish nurse, and it's just such a blessing to get to know and to do all the community outreach that she provides and to be involved in that has just been a blessing for both myself and for George. So we are so happy to be here. Patty, have you had opportunity for people where you now you're 12 month residents now now we are okay do you have people from where you currently live that have come as a result of your invitation or your good word spoken to them we've brought a few neighbors for the veterans um, and we do tell people about it but we're not in the close immediacy of here we live down off of uh, uh, 41 and um, Summerlin. So we're not exactly in the quote neighborhood. We drive a little bit for it. And there's several other Lutheran churches sure. in our area, but That's this right. is the one we we found and we're not about to leave. I think it'd be beautiful. Marilyn, if you could share a few stories from your ministry. I'm Marilyn Cranick. I'm the parish nurse at Peace Lutheran Church. Um, it has been such a privilege to work here. Um, because of the new facilities that are now available to us, we have developed, we have increased our dementia programs. Um, and this is an opportunity for somebody to bring their loved one to be cared for while they attend a support group. Um, and they just value that time so much. We have a great time with the visitors, with the guests. They have an opportunity to share their living circumstances with each other, and everybody feels supported in that. Um, what else? <laughs> I'm sorry? Oh, Tai Chi. Oh, we have uh, several exercise programs available. Um, Tai Chi is available through a federally funded program with the Area Agency on Aging, and that will bring in from 25 to 40 people, and a good portion of them are from the community. Uh, one of the more exciting events we had, we introduced, oh, I guess about a year and a half ago, um, Sit to Fit and Chair Aerobics. And Virginia Hanley came, and we would have one person attend. We would have two people attend. And we were just about to abandon the program when word got out at Wakahatchee um, that Virginia was here. And all of a sudden, we had 14 or 15 people and 20 people. And they are just glorious. They have been working on our senior center plans. Um, they frequently say, uh, that peace should be called the church of Jesus and health um, because they're so grateful to have this. Um, I will go back to the 
dementia support programs, we do get calls after people have gone home and they express exciting stories. Every time I get the phone call, I thought, uh-oh, something's wrong. But they say, no, uh, when we went through the gate of our community, John said, oh, now it's back to reality. Um, they come out and they all want more time doing, ha having these opportunities. Um, so this is where, where we're working. Thank you, Marilyn. That is being good news. Now, although I have been around peace relatively short time, I've come quickly to understand that volunteerism is part of that heart and soul of this congregation. I was attending a, uh, a gathering of volunteers uh, last week, and uh, it was spilling out into the hallway. There was, you physically couldn't get more people in the space where the meeting was being held. It was amazing. So I would love to hear from a couple of you uh, to tell your personal story of a volunteer, one, uh, a particular volunteer role that you either have played in the past or that you're continuing to play at the present and what that has meant personally to you. You can introduce yourself. My name is John Woodring. Um, I have to add to what Marilyn said about the uh, dementia program. Uh, my wife and I help volunteer and help with the uh, Romeo and Juliet program, which meets quarterly. Quarterly. Uh, we kind of haphazardly got involved, <laughs> but once we did, uh, mainly we, uh, well, my wife and another lady, Marcia, uh, do the food for it. And it's an amazing experience to sit with these, these people and to talk to them and to get them to uh, participate, which they do easily. Uh, it's, I think, we get as much or more out of that than they do. You know, you have a sense of, I'm doing God's work. And uh, as we know, uh, we serve God by serving others. And uh, it's a really rewarding experience. Thank you, John. Someone else would love to have others. Now, would you be able to share about your ministry of Pacific Island, Maryland? Al Brannick, uh, mainly because of Maryland, I got the opportunity to. Uh, people were coming too close to me. Some of our story. Okay. Um, Al and I would visit people, uh, residents at Pacifica, who were from the church. And from that, we saw that pe other people there wanted to participate in home communion as well. Um, so we go once a month. Uh, they're very cooperative. They bring maybe 20 people to be present. People will be wandering in later on and we offer communion. And it's so rewarding because many of these people will recite the Lord's Prayer. That is still written across their hearts and they may have trouble saying other things but they can recite the Lord's Prayer. And Al always brings cookies and that makes them happy. <laughs> they all have icing on their faces <laughs> when we're done. <laughs> But a couple of weeks ago, I asked Al, Al, how did we start doing this? I just could not remember how we started this ministry. And he goes, Marilyn, you asked me to. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Pacifica um, is a residence for people experiencing um, dementia. And it's, it's very lively. They have great activities. They have a great activity director. Um, take good care of these people. 
but they need to have spirituality brought into their lives as well. They, they have limited opportunities. And just having the face-to-face -face time, Al is wonderful with them. He can remember everybody's names and their backgrounds. And if somebody's missing, he'll say, where is so-and-so? And, -so? and um, it's just a lovely ministry. Hmm. Thank you. Al, thank you for what you do. I'd like to ask something that sounds absurd. But what if? What if Peace Lutheran Church were to unexplainably disappear? Would Peace Lutheran Church be missed? Now, it's a loaded question. And so I would anticipate that we would all answer that question with a yes, but I'm not going to let us go on to the next one yet, because I would really like to hear why, or if you could illustrate how it makes a difference in this community, both through intentional efforts and programs, like Pacifica, like the Gladiolus Food uh, Pantry, and many others. But I'm especially interested in that day-to-day, life-by-life, very naturally, very gently, with no photo ops being sought to be good news. Talk to me. If Peace Lutheran Church were to disappear today, would it be missed? And I'm going to give the microphone to someone. Yeah, I'm just thinking, Valerie, if you'd like to share about the small groups and what that means to people. Valerie, and then introduce yourself. I'm Valerie Neller. Um, as Pastor Walter said, I, I help coordinate the small groups here. Um, we have so many people who have so many opportunities to get involved and form uh, not only uh, spiritual relationships but social relationships and with the, the our you know our fitness programs um, it, it's truly a whole body uh, growth that you can get involved in here. There, it's so many different ways. We have Bible studies where you can grow in faith and grow in, in Christian fellowship with people and book clubs and card games and just Marilyn does her movies, lunch and movies. So it doesn't even have to be something, you know, that you have to come in and worry, oh, well, I don't like to do a study. I don't like to do that. You can just come in and enjoy social time with, with other Christians, which is, which is a really neat thing to be able to just so freely do here. Um, if, to me, if Peace Lutheran Church were not to be, um, I I think it would. I think it would reinvent itself another way because there's this close ties with the people here. Um, if the building disappeared, well, you meet at homes. You meet it. Go back to meeting in the Masonic Temple or something like that. Um, those kind. Those kinds of ties. I. I don't see could ever could could ever fall apart. Uh, you know because our main focus in in our bringing ourselves together here is with our love of Christ. And, and that's not something that can disappear in our lives. So it, it would just form in another way or another place. Um, but um, it, it's, it's in our hearts and we can't let that go. I applaud that answer. That's wonderful. Walter. I uh, feel very definitely that it would be a big loss to our neighborhood. 
Uh, when Peace uh, Church selected this land, one of the things that I and our the other, I took the lead but with the support of the leaders, was to really to make sure that we were the, not only the new kid coming on the, in on the block, because St. Column Kill and Faith were already planted in this area, but that we would form a partnership for the ministry of this neighborhood. And so uh, over the years, Peace and Faith and St. Column Kill Church churches have formed ways uh, at the food pantry, through music, through the many worship services that we have shared together. Um, most recently, uh, Reformation 500 that we did together. Uh, we're doing an event in early November on the 20th anniversary of the Joint Declaration on Justification. I think these things are loved and the people really appreciate it. Many people will come to a concert or will come to one of these worship services and they'll say, as a Roman Catholic, I was taught I couldn't go into your church. But I see that you, Pastor Walter and Father Joe or Father Lorenzo, we've gone back and forth and shared pulpits. Um, we both gave each other a tree for Reformation 500 as a symbol of the love that we have. I think those things are important to help to make our neighborhood what it is. And so I think it would be tremendously miss, missed uh, in our neighborhood. So we're going to keep it going and open and growing, John. <laughs> we're not closing. Amen. The church could be... Uh described using the analogy of a lighthouse and uh, lighthouses are not meant to compete because if the lighthouses start competing the ships wreck offshore and that is a marvelous thing that I have witnessed in the short term I've been here to see the the synergy and the connection between the other churches, working together to make a difference. Quite frankly, if I were a new resident in this area and I heard of or saw evidence of the churches in this area working cooperatively for the common good, it would restore my faith. Because I wouldn't, by nature, expect it. And, uh, I don't know all of the churches as well as Peace, but I do know that Peace Lutheran Church has taken a lead role in being that kind of catalyst to promote unity among the churches. Beautiful thing. Beautiful thing. Now, Sunday morning is very, very important. And uh, you folks sing. Oh, do you sing? Um, what happens in this magnificent space is very special and it's very important. It's part of the very essence of the church. But I'd like to hear a couple of you speak from your own vantage point as to not only what it's meant to you, but maybe in conversation with others, you have a sense of what the experience on Sunday morning means for the average person who's here. How encouraged they might be or inspired they might be or have hope and peace restored because they've been here. Or they've seen a sense of the wonder of God again. Could a couple of you speak to that, John? Uh, John Woodring again. Um, I'm also on uh, council. I've had people come up to me because I wear a tag that says I'm on council. And I've had visitors come up to me, now not a lot, but a few, and stop me and say, your congregation sings. <laughs> I go, yeah, we'd love to sing. He says, well, I've been in a lot of churches. You can't hear anything but the organ. I says, well, glad to have you. Glad to have your voice. Join right in. We love to sing. <laughs> What do you have to say, George? George Avery. <laughs> um, I've talked with people who have been here many years. I've talked to people. Patty and I have been here for about five. 
in our own beliefs, and they seem to be synonymous, you come into this church, first of all, there are a few things in life, I think, that can invigorate someone and bring them to motion like music. And we do it well here. Man, we have a terrific director of music and Rick and a choir. And you can just sit. It's magnificent to listen to. And it's quality every week. And you combine that with Pastor Walt, the liturgy, his sermon, which you can understand. And I've been to many, many churches, and some I've just walked away from blank. Highly educated men and women in the pulpit, but they just don't get it across. But I know, you know, Patty and I sit in the first row. We walk away understanding what he's talking about and in, in, invigorated every, every Sunday. And it's, it's uh, just a magnificent... Uh, way to start your uh, start your day and and go through your week in your life